Hi everyone, it's Fahed from Audiobookish. I'm joined by Poppy. Hiya. And we have a guest today, Sherry Green. Sherry is a bibliophile who teaches by day and reviews books by night. She is an avid user of Audible, Libby, Hoopla, and enjoys nothing better than nice hot beverages, well-narrated audiobooks, and long walks with her dog, Hannah. She's a proud member of the Publishing Hopeful group on Facebook and can be found on both Instagram and Twitter at Rye Reader. Hello, Sherry. How are you doing today? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you once again for taking the time to join us on the weekend. So let's kind of chat a little bit about you. So you're a librarian at the moment. Is that Oh, sorry, a teacher at the moment. I guess I see Biblio and I think like <laughs> library in French. So yeah. um, you're a teacher at the moment. What kind of um, class are you teaching? Is it teenagers, children? or I substitute teach through yeah. a like third party company, but I am currently teaching a classroom of second graders through basically the end of this school year. So they have been fun, but can definitely be a little bit of a handful. Yeah. And kind of what's it been like? Is, is that kind of in-class teaching or are you having to do that over Zoom or what's the uh, situation where you are at the moment? Is it relatively back to normal or is it, you know, stay away, two metres away sort of thing going on? Uh, it's been a little touch and go. So we are mostly doing a hybrid model. So we're in school four days a week. I'll have one group of kids on Monday, Tuesday, another group Thursday, Friday, and then Wednesdays we all log on virtually. However, this past week, we had spring break just recently. So we've all done a full virtual week together so that everyone can make sure that no one's bringing any germs back, hopefully. That's good. So we kind of got in touch through the Publishing Hopefuls group. So I was just wondering, how are you finding your kind of job hunt in terms of like looking for roles in publishing and that sort of thing? I think both myself and Poppy are quite keen to enter that industry as well. So yeah. just wondering how, how that was going. It's definitely been a learning journey trying mm. to figure out because my degree is not in journalism or it's not an English degree. I actually have a degree in theater, which seems very unrelated. However, it's it's all storytelling based um, mm -hmm. is how I'm looking at it. And that's what I want to do for people. I want to help tell stories and share them with others. So I really like helping people edit mm -hmm. their work so I would love to be an editor but of course I'd be thrilled with just about any role in the publishing industry at this <laughs> point I don't know about you guys yeah, I think Poppy you're quite interested in editorial roles aren't you yeah definitely kind of similar to you I enjoy helping other people tell their stories I mean I guess maybe when I was very very young the idea of being an author sounded good, but I, I very quickly went, you know what, no, I want to <laughs> help other people improve their stories. But also got, you know, interest in some other departments. Audio, definitely. Any role to do with audio would be amazing. And um, production stuff, a bit of rights. Um, but yeah, a bit like you, sort of a foot in the door would be fabulous. But it's kind of interesting because I'm definitely not so inclined to be a, a marketeer whereas I know for head that's where you kind of your skills lie yeah so I like marketing communication slash audiobooks is what I'm interested in editorial kind of like for me going over the same piece of text <laughs> over and over and over again I kind of had enough of that when I was working as a solicitor kind of revising contracts <laughs> so that's not something I'm particularly interested in going back to so before we kind of get into your like picks for your your favorite audiobooks. I just want to talk a little bit about your blocking and reviews that you're kind of doing at the moment on Instagram and Twitter. Kind of what, generally speaking, kind of what sort of books do you enjoy reading? I, over the last couple of years, have really been trying to read an even mix, a variety, but my favorite will probably always be historical fiction. I have attempted to include a little more nonfiction into my rotation in the last year or so as well, which is not usually my bag. I tend mm. to stick to memoirs and historical texts within that particular genre. I'm really not keen on the math and science books, unfortunately. What kind of historical period is your favorite to read stories from? Oh, anything, anything pre-1900. 
there's a lot of World War II era books coming out right now. And I'm like, oh, that sounds kind of cool. But like you put something, set it like a hundred years earlier <laughs> than that. And that is absolutely my jam. So is it kind of things like books by um, Kate Moss, that kind of thing that you're interested in? Yes. Yes, I enjoy some of her works. I've also been reading a little more fantasy lately, some YA mm. fantasy, as anyone who checks the Instagram feed will see. I read a couple of them the last month or so. One was The Trickster by Dorothy Windsor, and the second book in the Crowns of Croswald series by D.E. Knight. And those were both really fun reads. So kind of that like YA is something that Poppy's quite interested in as well isn't it really yeah yeah I'm, I'm a bit picky about it but I do enjoy it a lot and certainly yeah certain ones it's, it's good you've got permission to be a bit wackier and as some people might say childish I don't know just imaginative than adult books but you still have kind of grown-up themes yeah I've got a lot of favorites that fall under that genre so I think that's quite interesting because uh one of my favorite book podcasts at the moment is your own words and they're doing a lot of YA fiction on there at the moment. And, you know, you are allowed to go off and kind of explore maybe stranger ideas, but they're also talking about a couple of books where it was originally marketed as a YA fiction novel and then kind of repackaged towards the adult market to kind of maybe make it a little bit more palatable. I think that's also kind of like, oh, is it YA or is it is that just the marketing? I think that's also quite an interesting area as well. Yeah. So audiobooks, we're big fans of them, um, mm -hmm. obviously, over here. Kind of how did you first discover audiobooks and what's your favourite method of listening to them? I kind of like to do, do other things while I'm um, listening to audiobooks, but Poppy's very much more in favour of kind of like sitting down um, in a chair and having someone read her a story. <laughs> so what's your history with audiobooks and how do you like to listen to them? So I first started really getting into audiobooks while I was working an office job at like a small retail pharmacy chain. I was basically doing a lot of data entry and I noticed my coworkers had headphones in all the time. My supervisor finally said, you know what, that's that's fine as long as you have one earbud out can hear us and not while you're on phone duty. Mm. So I thought, all right, well, what am I going to listen to? And then I made my way through probably more books than I ever have before that year, <laughs> which was fun. Definitely made going to work uh, a little more enjoyable than it yeah. might have otherwise been. Yeah, it's a nice way to escape the kind of mind-numbing drudgery of <laughs> some jobs anyway. So we'd like to hear kind of um, what your top five audiobooks are. So um, what's kind of like your, your first choice? Okay, so first of all, putting together a list of my top five was incredibly difficult because yeah. I am no notoriously bad at favorites. However, yeah. I did collect a top five. I am not ranking them one through five, though. That's fine. Mm -hmm. In no particular order. That's fair. We'll let you off with that. <laughs> yes, yeah. absolutely. In no particular order. Um, the most recent one that I listened to that I really, really enjoyed was In Spite of Myself by Christopher Plummer. It was his memoir that I saw popping up, I think, on Twitter somewhere shortly after he passed. And of course, that was all over the internet. And I really think memoirs work so well as audiobooks, especially when you have the author narrating. Mm. It's such a personal thing to have someone tell you their life story. And this particular one is charming and at times even conspiratorial it's a lot of fun. I found myself listening in like small chunks while I would walk my dog and I was prolonging it. I didn't want to, I didn't want the one-sided conversation to end. I'm sure the listeners will be upset with us if we don't ask, uh, what kind of dog is your dog? <laughs> oh, she is a black lab mix. We're not sure with what, but she Aww. mostly looks like a black lab and she's quite old. She will be 13 this August. So she's a cranky old lady. <laughs> oh, awesome it's quite interesting what you say about biographies i don't think i've ever listened to a biography on audiobook in fact i've, I've probably not read any biography so i'm just yeah you know, i'd be curious to know kind of what what draws you to kind of like biographies and i think it's quite interesting kind of how people have different tastes in in what they read so i think the first memoir biography that i read was the glass castle by jeanette walls 
and it was an assignment for an AP English class my senior year of high school. And I really fell in love with that book. I even went on to read the one she writes about her grandmother, Half Broke Horses. I'm actually currently in the middle of a reread via audio of that one. And yeah, I think that's how I got hooked on them. I think the trick is finding people that you're interested in in the first place. A lot of actors, honestly, are most of mine. I just listened to one by Dick Van Dyke the other day. I've got a couple of, I think both of Julie Andrews' memoirs are on my TBR list. So Matthew McConaughey was on a TV show promoting his um, autobiography, Green Lights, and that's one that's kind of on my um, TBL list, if we are going to make it audio, because <laughs> uh, I think that would be really good. And I totally agree with your point about it's it's really cool if they can get the actual author to narrate it and have them telling the story. I mentioned in a previous podcast that for Trevor Noah's autobiography, I listened to the preview and decided I actually wanted to read it myself. But that's because I'm so used to him telling me stories through stand-up. And the style was just quite different because I could tell these were words written for the page as opposed to for the performance and so that's one instance where I kind of it it was just a bit too weird for me but yeah I think in other situations things like like that I guess with an actor or another person that I know then I yeah I definitely agree with you having them actually speak the story is uh is really cool I listened to um Carrie Fisher's book oh yeah and that was really cool as well so she'd done it as a one-woman show and then she'd written the book from it and then also recorded the audio and that was awesome because it was basically like I had tickets to a never-ending version of of the show so yeah that was really cool I can imagine so the Christopher Plummer biography what were kind of the standout moments for you through like the book was it the way that he narrated it or was there any particular moments in his life that kind of um struck a chord with you there are quite a few um standout moments for sure in his memoir he had managed to get into quite a lot of shenanigans as (laughs) uh, one can imagine but it was mostly his style of narration it was very conversational like i said conspiratorial is probably the best word i can i can think of it was like you were sharing a secret with him and that was really appealing to me so it's just like him kind of you know you're at a bar with him and he's kind of sharing some anecdotes with you rather than lecturing at you absolutely that's fascinating what's the the next one on your list the next one on my list i will take a tangent off of the Carrie Fisher one. Oh, okay. That was wishful drinking, by the way. Wishful. Okay, I'm going to add that to my TBR list. Um, Girls and Boys by Dennis Kelly. Mm. It was also written as a play, and it's performed as a one-woman monologue by Carrie Mulligan. And the material is really tough in regards mm. of subject matter, but the performance is like visceral. I like my jaw dropped a couple of times throughout the performance. And it's not a particularly long one either. As you can imagine, if it was originally written for the stage, obviously people are not going to sit there for five hours or more, but it was, it was incredibly impactful. And it's one that immediately stuck in my mind. You said top five. And I was like, I have to talk about this one. Without giving too many spoilers away, what's the, What's the story of the book? Girl meets boy and family falls apart. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Um, and y- you spoke a bit about the performance there. For me, sometimes audiobooks sound like audiobooks, but sometimes they kind of stray into that kind of strange radio play, audio play territory so how did you know did, did it feel like an audiobook to you or did it feel more like you were listening to a radio performance this particular one felt more like an audiobook to me i do have a couple others on my list that are full cast that stray more towards radio play but this one to me at least felt way more like an audiobook okay and how did you come across it was it just one that you heard about or I think it was one of the Audible originals that popped up as a suggestion one day. Mm. And I was like, okay, I'll 
I'll listen to the preview of it. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to have to, I got to listen to it all now. And yeah, I'm really glad I did. Yeah, I'm just out of curiosity. How many audiobooks do you get through a week? That varies. So I usually have a few books going at one time. I used to be very like, I read one book at a time and then I can move on. And now I'm like, I might have three or four books going at a time. Exactly the same. Yeah, weirdly. I was, yeah same journey (laughs) (laughs) so i will usually have so for example right now i have a discovery of witches by deborah harkness going Mm. as like a physical copy that i'm very slowly making my way through uh lately i've had an ebook that i will be reading mostly for review purposes for blogging and then i have one audiobook i will listen to while cleaning the house or walking the dog I am a multitasker. I find it very hard for me to just sit still and listen most of the time. And I will reread via audio another book at night before I go to bed. Okay, that's not quite a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm, I'm probably reading one graphic novel, listening to one audio book, and then maybe reading another. When you're like multitasking books, do you like to kind of mix and match genres or yes i definitely try and mix up my genres a little bit so i'm not like burnt out on any one particular type of story that's good um and how do you select which books that you choose to review because i've certainly fallen into the trap of like requesting like a ton of titles from net galley and then realizing maybe a third of the way through the book that it's perhaps not for me and i, I don't really like giving negative reviews of something so what's your policy in regards to to that yes that was something i was definitely concerned about when i started doing this Uh, most of the books that i have been reviewing so far uh, i have been approached to review them they were not necessarily ones that i was requesting through a site as of yet in fact i don't think i've requested anything on that galley yet without a prior understanding that it would be approved oh cool so how do you get um, publishers to approach you? Because myself and Poppy, we've done an interview with our first author as part of our kind of blog tool. How did you get interest from publishers? So the first one that I was approached about, it was a publicist for a self-published author. And they were trying to up her reviews on Goodreads and everywhere else in anticipation of releasing another book later this year. So that was my very first like experience with that. And then they asked me to do the sequel as well. I had a friend send me a post by the author Mia Hayes looking for people to work on her book tour for Always Yours B, which is another memoir that I was very interested in being able to review that one. And then The Trickster was, again, I think it was a publisher very, very small indie publisher that was looking to promote a new book. So I haven't had any experience with like the big five or anything yet. It's been mostly small, independent publishers, self-published authors. No, but that's, that's good. I'm kind of just speaking from my, my own personal experience. The only times I've been approached to be part of a book tour was through my um, graphic novel reviews that I did for NetGalley. So I get quite often offered reviews for books by dead reckoning they publish a lot of like world war ii army stories and it's interesting how different bloggers approach reviewing stuff as well so you know when you're sitting down to kind of like do review how do you how does your process work do you start off with an idea of what you think about it do you kind of more because when i'm starting write, writing reviews i've got a general idea of what i think about but as i write it i sometimes change my opinion of what um <laughs> what i actually think about it so how does your how does your process work Yeah, I've kind of had the same thing happen to me, especially as I was writing the first one for The Crowns of Croswald. The first couple of pages, I hadn't read YA in quite a bit prior to that. And I had forgotten just that the style was a little bit different. And at first, it felt a little bit silly to be reading it. And so I think I was projecting that onto the book rather than like realizing that was just my own feelings because I hadn't read YA in a while. There was nothing Mm -hmm. at all wrong with the book. So I think by the time I finally got through it and started writing the review, I was like, okay, I can see the influences because it was heavily influenced by like the world of Harry Potter and a couple of other 
uh, magical worlds, but that was the one that like stood out the most. I was like, I see where you're going with this. And it grew on me as I, as I had to think about it more. Yeah. It's, uh, it's quite interesting. I think a lot of, did, did either of you guys see that thing on publishing Twitter about how a lot of readers are kind of like turning to, to YA at the moment, because the language you usually it's written is, is a lot, it's, it's more straightforward. It requires like, not I said less concentration, but it's just easier to process. And, you know, think especially at the moment, a lot of people, their attention spans and concentrations might be a little bit compromised for, for obvious reasons. Did either, did either of you kind of like see that Twitter thread at all? I don't know that I saw that explicitly, but yeah, I, I get what you mean. It's because it doesn't feel like it needs to try and be really sophisticated and, <laughs> and adult and stuff like you find some books or I guess some authors that are just tr- basically trawling through comp- yeah trawling yeah. through a thesaurus or whatever to uh yeah. you know, come up with fancy words <laughs> and you're not always going to know that you're going to come across that you know you might pick up a book that synopsis seems great all seems good and then you get a bit of the way into it and realize quite how dense and stuff it is and I guess yeah people know that with YA because it's pitched at you know, a certain reading level, I guess, because people are still learning as teens and developing the ability to understand language and and everything like that, that, yeah, they can usually guarantee that it's not going to be taxing in that, in that sense. Yeah. So just out of um, kind of interest, what kind of books are your children reading at the moment, Sherry, in terms of like either stuff that's on the curriculum or books that they're talking about, just if children do talk to their teachers about books they're reading at home it's been a long time <laughs> since, since i've been in the in school so I, 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 I wouldn't be too sure about that but yeah yes so our classroom book right now our chapter book that we're making our way through is charlotte's web by E. B. white mm. oh, love it love it yeah, yeah. yeah. absolute classic and as far as like their personal picks that i see them pulling from like the classroom library and our school library when we do get to go there's a series called Dog Man that is super popular, specifically yeah, for boys yeah, right Dave now. Yeah, Pikey, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Captain Underpants has withstood <laughs> the tough time. Still very popular. Um, I'm trying to think. Because sometimes the kids will be like, hey, can you have Miss Cameron pull books about such and such topic? And I think the last week before break, our very interesting mix was Vampires, Cars, Dogman was in there, and I think Dogs was the other one. So those those are the interests of eight year olds right now. Yeah, nice. Okay, that's that's yeah, that's good to know. Um, there's a you know, like especially in the comic book community at the moment, which is kind of like my other strong interest. There's kind of a lot of noise about you know, you know the death of comic books and comic book stores shutting down. But I just think people still reading comics is just like different types then they might not be reading kind of a lot of spider-man and batman single issue collections but um mm. they'll be going to things like reina tomegia's small series or the babysitters club or you know stuff like um you know Dogman and captain underpants and stuff like that so uh what's the next pick on your list all right my next pick is the graveyard book by neil gaiman which mm. does kind of fall into the YA territory. It is a full cast recording, which I find fun every once in a while. I like to break it up. Um, mm-hmm. I think the cast of this particular one is fantastic. Julian Ryan Tut plays one of the main characters, and he is excellent in this. Uh, that's yeah. I, I do love myself a bit of Neil Gaiman. Have you read that book, Poppy? I haven't. No, it's on the list. I do need to make my way through a lot of his stuff. I've read some, but not not all of it but i am keen on that one and i mean definitely yeah if it's got a full cast audio then that is the way to get <laughs> get me there um <laughs> so yes that might be creeping up my list so um what drew you to that particular book was it again just something that was recommended by audible or how did you come across it i had been reading a bunch of neil gaiman books prior to that i was just kind of on a roll and i was you know my next audible credit came up so i was like okay well let's, let's see what neil gaiman titles are available and that was one of the ones that I hadn't read yet. And mm-hmm. the fact that it had a full cast was a draw for me. Okay, that's uh, fantastic. So the Graveyard book's got a great, great setup. If you want to tell the listeners a little bit about what the Graveyard book is about. Yes. So the Graveyard book is centered around our main character. His name's Bod. And 
Bod is an orphan who is being raised in this cemetery, this graveyard, by all of these ghosts. And, you know, eventually he comes and he meets a girl that can see him because others have not noticed him until that point. And he forms a friendship with her. And there is a particularly uh, gruesome villain that makes an appearance again in Bob's life. And so he feels like he has to protect this girl while also figuring out what happened to his parents. And it's a lot of fun. And I love anything with ghosts in it is my jam too. I like that. See that for me, um, the graveyard book is kind of like perfect entry level horror sort of thing because it's, Mm. it's not explicitly, I mean, there are a lot of scary moments in the story, but it's not too gory. It's not especially violent, but there is like this, you know, especially when the villains come in because it kind of initially it starts off as more of a, I'd say more of a, like a coming of age story of this boy struggling with the decision to you know, stay within the comfort of like where he's been raised to maybe go out and explore the world a little bit more. And then that's kind of, for me, what was one of the main themes of the story at the start, but then it kind of, it does go into other kind of weirder, stranger areas as the more horror elements creep in. Yes. And I think the thing about horror as a a genre here is, at least via audio, it's all about the suspense. It's mm. not like the movies where you have jump scares and you're like, oh no, what just happened? It's this creeping sense of dread that sneaks up on you bit by bit as you read. And I love that. Yeah. I um, Horror is really difficult to do well. It's really, really, really difficult to do well. And I think it's kind of a testament to Gaiman's writing that there's kind of enough humor in there. If he writes superb characters, he gives them like, like fantastic like foibles and catchphrases and stuff like that. Especially if I remember correctly, I, I think I remember Bod's like foster parents being mm-hmm. particularly humorous in kind of certain aspects of the way they treat Bod. Absolutely. So what's your next pick on the list? My next audiobook pick is another horror one. It's a collection, The Conception of Terror, Tales Inspired by M.R. James, Volume 1. I believe it's another Audible original. It has a fantastic group of narrators. I remember being particularly fond of Pearl Mackey's performance in her, I think it's four or five different stories that have been adapted for this. So it's Casting the Runes, Lost Hearts, The Treasure of Abbot Thomas, and A View from a Hill. So the one I'm thinking of is The Treasure of Abbot Thomas. Okay, that's that's really... Have you read any um, M.R. James? That was my first exposure to him, and it was awesome. Yeah, he's he's really good. I remember reading one of his horror anthologies, over Christmas, and again, it's, it's as as you mentioned, Sherry. It's it's not about necessarily jump scares. It's more about like this creeping sense of dread that he he manages to build up for kind of like small. You, you're not too fierce, an in, innocuous thing, or if it's something a little bit more sinister that's that's happening in the events of his books. Mm-hmm. Have you read any of M. R. James Poppy? I actually haven't. I don't usually massively go in for horror stuff, but I sort of I don't know go in for anything that seems interesting i'm not kind of close it off as a genre but i don't necessarily seek it out if that makes sense um what would be the kind of the one i should start with sherry what would you kind of recommend for um poppy to start off with in that particular uh, anthology that i use listening to or just kind of mr james yeah. stuff i would start with mr james and i i really liked casting the runes that's the one that drew me in first so i if you can find a copy of casting the runes that would be a good place Mm, okay casting the runes is that the one that's set on the beach or am i thinking of a different one no i think you might be thinking of a view from a hill maybe ah okay all right what's the basic setup for casting a rune so there is an academic who is sent a paper for review and she doesn't hold back on her thoughts at all and the writer is less than pleased with that particular situation and he seeks revenge after receiving his rejection note very good and so you've kind of mentioned horror a couple of times is that 
kind of the horror, I think that goes in with your interest in maybe historical fiction as well as are those two genres that you like to see mixed together in the stories that you that you read? I don't think I've come across too many stories where it's, you know, an even mix of horror and historical fiction. But if you know of any titles, I would love to check that out. Oh, there is Kostova's book. Let me let me just carry out a quick Google check. Yeah, Elizabeth Kostova, she does a lot of books around not strictly speaking like historical fiction but there's um yeah that's it the historian so it's kind of i think i have a copy of that i haven't read it yet but i do have it's a copy. R- really good so she's basically it's this epic story of this historian going on a journey to uh, hunt down dracula and it's mm-hmm. it's really really it's really good I, I would class it as like historical fiction slash horror because there's definitely elements of that in the story as well so yeah it's um it's really well done and just you know going back to the mr james did they have any like sound effects amplify the creeping horror or was it mostly done through the vocal performances of the narrators i believe there were audio effects i can't think of the name of the specific like instrument that you think of that's just the creepy sounds generic scary music that just you're like oh no something bad's gonna happen i think a couple of times we hear just ambient noise like footsteps and first rustling things like that oh that's interesting yeah i like when i don't know if heads maybe less less keen on this but i like when audio has those kind of obviously if they're done well has those side effects to work in with what's going on and and things like that it's something that i love from one of my favorite children's audiobooks you're a bad man mr gum and yeah i think it's fabulous when it does that and it builds the whole thing and it is kind of doing that floating between book and radio play kind of kind of stuff yeah yeah it's something we talked about with rebecca a little bit really and mm-hmm. so we interviewed rebecca fortain she's a audiobook editor over at i think it's called farshall books now isn't it mm-hmm. they've, they've changed it between our recording and releasing <laughs> Yeah, between our recording and releasing, they've changed the name of her imprint. She was at Egmont and she really kind of enjoys it when they push the audiobook format. And the way she explained it, that that's something that happens a lot more in children's fiction because like they haven't got people like me saying, well, I don't really like that. <laughs> um, so, but, you know, horror is another um, genre, I think, where you can kind of play around with that a little bit more kind of like wind rustling leaves and the knocking of doors and things of that nature don't know where you fall on the spectrum of that i think probably more towards poppy side in terms of like having more sound effects and musical things in your audiobook sherry to a certain point i think it can always be overdone i am not a fan of like when they have even like a 30 second piece of music before a chapter feels like ages sometimes and i'm like this this is totally unnecessary just start the chapter please i want to keep reading (laughs) But I don't yeah. mind other sound effects and stuff or like music that plays very quietly under the narration. But anything mm-hmm. that disrupts the narration, I tend to avoid. Yeah, it's definitely all about doing stuff well, isn't it? Yes. Whatever we say that we like, there's always going to be ways that there's bad ex- <laughs> examples of it and <laughs> mistimed sound effects or the sound effects just sound very superimposed onto the thing and go from silence to sound effects <laughs> and kind yeah. of things. So yeah, definitely bad examples, but it sounds like that one's a good example of the technique. Yeah. yeah I think another example is The Mermaid of Black Conch, where they kind of just mm. use the music to accent the chapter changes from one narrator to another. And it just yeah, it really, really it just, yeah, it's really good. If you haven't listened to that, that's, I don't know if it's my favorite audio book of the year, but it's going to probably take some beating. How many books are we in? We have three books in, aren't we? Four. Right? Four. Okay. I'm re- I did this one. last time we did the top five. <laughs> I, I miscounted how many books we are in. Um, so um, <laughs> what's the next book on your list? Book number five is Rosamund Pike's version of Sense and Sensibility ah. by Jane Austen. Oh, okay. Um, We've changed tone slightly. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Rosa, yeah obviously, Rosamund Pike's a brilliant actor. I think she's she, she's marvelous. Uh, did you choose Sense and Sensibility, or were you more drawn to the Rosamund Pike aspect of it? Kind of, how did you end up um, choosing to listen to that particular version? So, Rosamund Pike was a bonus. I was looking just for a audio version of Sense and Sensibility. I 
like reading Jane Austen's works, and I find the audio versions at night are they're a comfort read for me, so I can listen to them. I don't have to think too much about it. Nothing bad is ever going to happen in them <laughs> that will be resolved by the end of it. Her voice is soothing in these recordings, so that's a nice like wind down for me. Does she do all the different voices, or does she kind of very much stay in like Rosamund Pike cut glass English? accent or does she take a run up at the different characters as well because there's a lot of fun characters that you can do in Jane Austen Jane Austen books yes I think for the most part she sticks to just her natural speaking voice there's like a slight shift between when she's reading actual dialogue and the rest of the narration but other than that I don't think she goes for full-on character voices it's been a little bit since I've listened to this one I was wanting to ask you about that actually as well because I didn't do a degree in it but I also have a kind of theatre background and uh, really love that and really love the storytelling on the stage and I think that one of the reasons I love audiobooks so much is because they combine books with performance and that really actively way of doing it so often actors that do all sorts of work often are really good as narrators because yeah they've got a lot of the same things that they're trying to pull into it delivering their lines right it's it's all that same sort of thing and just being amazing performers do you think that's kind of something that is also why you like audiobooks yes and I also think that's why I'm pulled to certain titles more than others if it's Mm. an actor that I am familiar with and enjoy their other work and I know I enjoy their voice I am more apt to give that title a go than say another one that's been narrated by it could be somebody brilliant but maybe that I haven't heard of before Mm, it's interesting that isn't it because obviously I guess publishers have got to make that decision of weighing up like stardom but also like the cost Mm -hmm. that comes with that but the pull that just that name can have as well as obviously the talent that they'll bring to it and then also lifting up other voices that yeah that we've not heard so much from at the moment and that maybe in some ways are a slightly better fit I don't know and stuff like that it's interesting Mm -hmm. it is tricky um you kind of mentioned your background and that studying theatre and I think casting is is such a big part of making sure that a production is mm. successful. What do you think makes a good audiobook narrator? Oh, goodness. I think one of the most important things, which I, I did mention with Rosamund Pike, is there should be at least a subtle shift between, okay, this is my dialogue voice and this is my, mm. this is what's happening action-wise voice, because sometimes there isn't. And it it can get a bit confusing at that point. Um, One of the other things that I really look for in a narrator is, and you would think this one would be like a no brainer, but like your voice can't be monotone. Mm. Nobody wants to listen to that. And I, I listened to a recording of the Queen's Gambit after watching the Netflix series because I didn't know it was based on a book. Mm. The book is brilliant. The narration is atrocious. I had Mm. to speed it up to not quite double i think it was like 1.5 times the normal speed yeah yeah i usually listen to most of my audiobooks on two times speed <laughs> um yeah i've got that terrible modern lack of attention sometimes <laughs> and I think, I think it's, it's really bad <laughs> because obviously they've read the book at a particular speed to give their performance nuance and empathy and emotion and i'm probably missing out on a lot of that due to the speed I listen to audiobooks at. But yeah, I can completely understand being trapped with someone who's just speaking in a monotone voice as well and feeling the need to speed that up as well. Yes. For the most part, I I always try and listen at the normal speed for those reasons, but sometimes you just can't. (laughs) Yeah. Your own sanity. Um, Okay. Is that all five of your books? Yes. That's great. So you're a publishing hopeful, like uh, myself and Bobby. Why the interest to get into the industry and what draws you to kind of like publishing as an industry? And so it sounds a bit like a job interview now, isn't it? Why do you want to work here? (laughs) Um, So yeah, just what what, what draws you to get into an industry that's, you know, as challenging financially and difficult to enter as publishing? Well, I think my personal problem is I'm drawn to the creative industries as a whole like I said I studied studied theater in college at that point with the intent to work in theater like for life as a living Mm -hmm. that has obviously not totally happened I do 
a little bit of theater work. I work at a couple of local high schools as a technical director, and I help them put up their shows, teach them how to produce a live show. Nice. But it comes back to storytelling. Again, Mm -hmm. theater is just a different way of doing that. I never did any of the acting. I'm always, I do the backstage. I would stage manage. I would build the sets. I've done hair, wig, and makeup work, everything but the acting. So it felt natural kind of to switch over into a different form of storytelling um, via the written word. And again, it's publishing is the backstage side of that industry. Yeah. Whereas the writer is, I guess, the equivalent of your actor. Mm. Yeah. So I'm um, kind of, you know, just going back to like the theatre side of it, because I've volunteered at a theatre for a while as well. So was it mostly like producing or more that on the technical side where you worked in terms of what you kind of majored in? A university just because i'm interested in how um Mm -hmm. theater work goes on just generally just having volunteered at a theater for a while so the particular program that i was a part of i had a choice between two one of which would have been design and production which is the one i probably should have gone for but did not (laughs) it's a story for another time i did a general bachelor of theater arts which meant a lot of like theater history classes. You did have to take, you know, a couple of basic acting classes. I took some stage management classes. So stage managers are, we assist the director. We are the ones running rehearsals. We're the ones calling light cues and sound cues and making sure the crews are doing what they're supposed to be doing backstage. We're kind of running everything in that sense, in the non-creative sense. So I ended up doing a lot of stage managing. That was my main goal. I wanted to stage manage professionally. But I also worked in the scene shop for a couple of years, building the sets and installing them into the different theaters. I enjoyed that work. It kept me a little more active instead of sitting down for five-hour rehearsals every evening, which can be a bit much at times. Mm. And then I kind of fell into the wig work. I didn't anticipate that one, that it's become an oddly useful skill and really annoying when you watch TV and movies. So distracting. Yeah, I can imagine, um, you know, maybe, maybe a little bit distracted by some of the, the weird wigs in some of the period dramas, if you watch any of those as well. I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so thank you for taking the time to speak to us. It's been uh, really good. You know, it's definitely some of those books I'm going to be checking out. Yeah, thank you. It's been really good and nice to get to know you and find so many things in common. It was really nice. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's been my pleasure. So um, just once again, where can people find you on social media? Yes, I am at Rye Reader on both Instagram and Twitter. I promise I will get better at Twitter someday. Today is not that day. <laughs> <laughs> Your Instagram is pretty impressive, you know, kind of having... Yeah, over 2,000 followers on there. And um, and yeah, wonderful pictures. Yeah, what really, really Thank nice you. work on your uh, Instagram and kind of you write really well written reviews as well. So if you're looking for another person for like book recommendations in audiobooks or whatever the format may be, please check out uh, Sherry's stuff on social media. I just want to do a really quick shout out to one of my other podcasts that I do. So I've got a podcast called In Constant pod and i recently interviewed mental health activist and comedian sam white and yeah i think it was just is a really good chat about how we were coping in lockdown and the weird grooming habits we had as teenagers so please give that a listen as well okay so that's it uh thank you sherry once again thank you so much thank you for having me that's it guys okay bye bye, bye.